I want to put Slido up on the screen. I think we have that ready for you. Uh, you have the opportunity to engage a little bit. This is a pre-sermon quiz uh, that we'll make sure is submitted to the registrar's office and we'll update your GPA accordingly. Um, you can scan the code on your cell phone. You can go to the, the web link slido.com. You can go to the URL slido.com, put in the code 114. Uh, we've used this a lot in Elevate, so we're going to trial run this in Summit and see how you guys like it. Uh, scan that QR code, slider.com, put in the code 114. Those of you that are watching online, you also can join us as well. I see some people still scanning a little bit. Quick five-point quiz this morning isn't going to take too much of time, but just kind of gets us percolating on our topic today. You in? Most. Okay. Well, let's, let's dive in. Uh, let's go to put the first one up on the screen. Prayer is important to me and my life. Scale of one to five, five being the most important, one being not very important at all. Prayer is important to me and my life. If you haven't gotten in yet, it's QR code still up on the screen, code slido.com, or the URL slido.com, code 114. Uh, about 100 of you responding. It's about probably a uh, fifth or sixth of this room. Uh, predominantly, the room says prayer is significantly important to me in my life. About 67% of us are hanging out on that end. It's kind of a gradiated curve the other way. Let's go to the next one. should say, I am satisfied with my prayer life. You just said it's really important to you. I am satisfied with my prayer life. Five is very important. One is or very satisfied. One is very unsatisfied. And of course, you can kind of read it in the middle. Oh, all of a sudden, the room moved from one end to, to kind of the middle. We've got the bell curve going on today. We'll let your professor know. All right, we're, we're kind of 50-50. We're in the middle in our prayer life. The, the 6%, uh, can we talk after the worship service today? Like, we'll, we'll meet, like, we need to talk to you. The 7% that's hanging out there in the five that you're very satisfied with your prayer life. All right, three more. We'll go through these quickly. I have prayers that have gone unanswered. I have prayers that have gone unanswered. I heard an audible yes you couldn't even just put it on your phone. You had to say yes. That wasn't supposed to be a jab. I was emphasis. Come on. I have prayers that have gone unanswered. 62% of us say yes. Again, the, the 20% of us that say no, I have, I have prayers that have actually, all my prayers have been answered. Um, let's talk as well. Some of you are kind of in the maybe. But again, two-thirds of us say we have prayers that have gone unanswered. Two more. Sometimes I don't know the words to say when I pray. Sometimes I don't know the words to say when I pray. But 75% of us are saying yes, that we don't know the words to say when we pray. 20% again, you've got prayer on lock. I'm sorry we're going to be spending three months going through this. Um, you should probably be leading this out in about 14 maybe. Okay, last one. Prayer is where heaven touches earth. Yes, no, or maybe. Prayer is where heaven touches earth. I want to hear from you this morning. Almost 100% say yes. Congratulations, you've passed the quiz. You're going to do very well this morning. Thank you for participating. It just gets our mind kind of thinking about prayer. We may use this kind of off and on throughout this sermon series. If you've got your Bibles, I know you've got your phone in front of you, head on over to the Bible app. Go to Luke 11. We're going to be in Luke 11 today and spend some time in Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. The choir is going to sing again. Um, it wasn't just because we're full and we said, hey, we need to sit on the stage. They're, they're going to be singing one more time. Uh, and they're going to be singing the Lord's Prayer. And first service today was magnificent. I know it's going to be exactly the same and even better uh, in this service. No pressure, okay? Luke 11. Go ahead and put that up on the screen for you. Luke 11, verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. It was Jesus' regular habit and routine to get away by himself and to pray. It was how he communicated and more than just communication, it was how he was in community with his Father in heaven. It's his safe place, the place where he got to go and hide, the place where he got to bear his soul before his Father in heaven. And one day, we don't know when exactly in the day, and we don't know exactly where the place is. It doesn't matter for this story. Jesus is praying, and it prompts something in his disciples. That when he had finished, they were very polite at this point. They didn't want to interrupt him. He was deep in, in, in prayer. One of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. 
some of Jesus' disciples were originally disciples of John the Baptist. And they would have grown up, or not grown up, but they'd been under the tutelage of John the Baptist, and they'd learned how John the Baptist had taught them to pray. And it was a regular practice for a rabbi to teach his disciples theology through prayer. And he would give them particular prayers to pray, and there are many recorded by different rabbis, and there's one that's kind of ones that have become kind of accepted kind of more broadly, and others that were a little bit more obscure. And John had taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus' disciples now come to him and say, Lord, what you've got going on, John taught us something about prayer, but teach us to pray. We need to learn how to pray. There was something about the way Jesus prayed that caught his disciples' attention. They wanted to learn what Jesus had. Now, uh, a few years ago, and my dad set this story up well, so you'll find out why I don't know how to drive fence posts. One summer, we were living out in Abilene, Texas, kind of a couple hours out uh, west uh, I-20, right? And uh, we were there doing the thing. I was, I don't know, I think seven, eight, nine, somewhere around in that age. I, it's a little fuzzy now. Um, you know, old age kind of sets in a little bit. Um, and... <laughs> There was a, a special on PBS. I grew up on PBS. Loved the, the kids shows and whatnot. That they were, they were showing the, these two people fencing. This, this kind. You know, they've got the, like, almost like the Moonlander suit on. And they've got the, the mesh in front of their face. And they've got the suit on with the little kind of mini sword that they do the little, the little dance. And if they can bob and weave. And I don't think that's sachet. I don't know what it is. Uh, if you touch it just the right time and moment... A little buzzer will go off because your sword's connected to a little thing and you'll earn a point. And I saw this and they're doing a little special on it in PBS. And I was like, I want to learn how to fence. Yeah, some of you already get it. And I, I go to my dad and I'm like, dad, I want to learn how to fence. And it was kind of early summer and the summer went on. And about midsummer, I realized something had gone horribly wrong. That instead of learning how to do this, We'd gone to the church property, and there's about 20 acres, new church building going on, that needed, guess what? A new fence. And so instead of doing this, I learned how to do this. Right? And that has stuck with me to today. Um, and I've, we've, I've put a fence in on their property a couple years ago, and it, I, it takes a little bit of work, and you, know, you get sore at the end of the day, but you know, driving those fence posts in. But my desire was to learn... I just didn't really do a good job of communicating what I wanted to learn. Or he understood, but there was like, no way we're doing that. You're going to learn how to fence. Uh, that probably uh, was, was the, the actual reason. The beautiful thing about prayer, though, is that prayer can be learned. You can learn how to pray. It's something that in the same way that we learn how to speak language, we're teaching our son how to speak even today. He hasn't picked up on it yet. Um, still three months old, right? Uh, he knows how to communicate, that's for sure. Hasn't quite figured out how to put words to that yet. But our lives are lives lived out learning how to communicate with the people around us. And I would offer to you today that our Christian walk, our walk with Jesus, our relationship with Jesus is the same way. That prayer is a learned communication tool. That's why it's going to take three months for us to go through this. Jesus responds to his disciples in verse two of Luke 11. He said to them, when you pray, and I want to pause there because we run ahead to the Lord's prayer and we kind of get into that. It's like, okay, here's how I pray and do all this. But look at what Jesus says. He says to them, when you pray, what's assumed in Jesus' response to his disciples? That you're going to be praying Prayer is not an if in the Christian life, it is a when. Because there's something inside of us, no matter joy or pain, that when we encounter circumstances that are beyond our control, that something inside of us reaches out to the divine and says, maybe it's just the prayer of Peter, Lord, help me. It's instinctual to who we are as a human being. And what Jesus tells his disciples is that I assume you're going to be praying. So when you pray, pray this way. It says, Father, hallowed be your name. Prayer is an assumed part of what it means to follow Jesus. 
before we even get into the mechanics of the Lord's Prayer and what the outline is and the structure and the text and everything else, Jesus assumes that you're going to be praying. And we affirm that assumption every time we fall on our knees or on our kitchen floor with a cool floor to tile. Jesus takes his disciples through the Lord's Prayer. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it today because we're, we're just going to take Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer and just stretch that out over several weeks. Luke 11, verse 2, Jesus tells them this, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we, have also, for, as, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Ellen White tells us that this account in Luke is a later one than what happens in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has already given the Sermon on the Mount at this point and given the long form version of the Lord's Prayer, or better, maybe called the Disciples' Prayer. And Jesus gives the Spark Notes, Spark Notes version. He condenses it down a little bit. And what he articulates to his disciples is that you can address God, the God of the universe, your creator, as Father. You have an intimate relationship with God. You can call him dad, daddy, papa, whatever your name is for God. You can call him father. And that name, by the way, is not to be taken lightly. It must be declared holy. It must be set aside. And as we embrace the character of God and the Holy Spirit flows through us, we carry that name. So it's more than just cussing or letting a, an occasional, you know what, into your language. It's saying that I carry the badge and the name of God and everything I do is representative of him. As we live well in this life, we honor and make holy the name of God. And he says the one request that you should make, well, one of two, may your kingdom come. We long for a kingdom. We long for this earth to be made new. Lord, would your kingdom come? By the way, would you give us some bread? We're a little bit hungry. God is our provider. Not only is he our provider, he is our forgiver. When we ask, he forgives. And then lead us not into temptation. It's not that God actively does that. It's just the way of saying, let God be the one who's directing your life. Let him be the one that's setting the course, setting the guard, whatever it needs for you to live inside of his will for you. God, be that for us. Lead us not into temptation. And then Jesus will tell two stories, which is the bulk of what we will look at today. We'll come back to uh, the Lord's Prayer in long form over the next couple of weeks. Here's Jesus to his disciples, Luke 11, verses five through eight. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of, my, uh, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, this story, I know you've heard a sermon on this story. I know, you, I know you've heard somebody speak on this. And we hang on that line, shameless audacity. And we often come to the conclusion at the end of this story that prayer equals persistence. That prayer is something that, that we just, we've got to keep coming back to God. God, would you give? God, would you give? Please, 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 please. Like a kid at the cashier register that sees the rack of candy bars in the grocery store knows that your kid will see it or you will see it. And it's just perfectly placed right there. So at the end of the trip, mommy, daddy, please, 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 please. And you don't give your kid that candy bar, do you? Well, maybe some of us. Some of you are just ruthless, right? <laughs> I know where I get it, right? This story is not so much about our persistence in prayer. What Jesus tells his disciples is an absolutely absurd story. This story is filled with sarcasm because this, this story would be so out of what would actually happen that the disciples would be chuckling. Because when you had a visitor come into town, it was your responsibility to take care of them and the responsibility of the community to take care of them. We live in wonderful communities today, 
where we go to our home, we open the door, we go in, we shut the door behind us, and we lock it and make sure our ring doorbell is on so that if anybody comes and knocks on the door or rings the doorbell, we can check and see who that might be. And if it's not somebody you recognize, or if it is and you don't want them to come in or know that you're home, we are not home, all right? We're, we are not here. In our society today, we live in what I think is a facade of community. That we've got houses that are next to each other, but are we really neighbors? Do we welcome each other into our homes? This story, when the person comes and asks for bread, would be a regular occurrence. And by the way, Jesus says that they're friends. There's an honor relationship between the two that the, the friend would honor the request. And he says, hey, my kids are asleep and the lights are out and the door is locked. Everybody kind of slept in, this, in, in a one-room home. And he's like, it's a little bit obnoxious to get up and over. That wouldn't have happened. He would have absolutely gotten up and gone out. And Jesus says, if we can go back one verse to verse eight. We go back one verse. I tell you, even though he will not give up and give you the bread because of friendship, that's the sarcasm sneaking in. Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This story is not so much about your persistence. It's about the relationship you have with the person you're asking for bread. Because the friend is honor bound to give you bread and will not let his own honor. If the friendship is not enough for him to give you bread, the honor that he holds will make him get up and get bread. Because nobody wants someone to continue to pound on their door. Please be quiet. Let's, I'll get you some bread. Prayer is more about a relationship than getting the words right. And it's about saying those words to the person that you're in relationship with. Like how Joel Green puts it in the New International Commentary on the New Testament, Jesus identifies God as the father whose graciousness is realized in his provision of what is needed, and indeed far beyond what might be expected to those who join him in relationship. God's after a relationship with you, and that's what prayer is all about. God desires for you to come to his door. And this is a bad example in scripture what God does. Jesus says he's the exact opposite. He's gonna get up and honor that relationship. He cares about you so much that he will answer. Now, we may not always get what we think we want or need. More on that to come in the future. But God will always answer answer to the point that Jesus encourages his disciples after this story, Luke 11 verse 9, you've got it in your Bible. So I say to you, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus says about the Father that you have access to everything you need. So go ahead and ask and watch God work. I think sometimes we look at God as a withholder. And that's why we have to keep coming back and we've got it in our mind. If I just ask long enough, God will give it to me because I have to convince him to give me good things. God already desires to give you good things. Jesus opens up the floor and says, ask anything you need and you'll receive. You seek God, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. Jesus continues, Luke 11, verses 11 through 13. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven, your Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is a giver of good gifts. He says, you fathers know how to take care of your children. And I'd imagine you wouldn't give something to someone that you love that was a bad gift, would you? Well, there was a couple of Christmases ago where it was kind of a prank, right? Um, and, you know, I, sure. Most of the time, you're going to give something good to somebody that you love. If you're ever wondering what God gives, God gives good gifts. And even greater gifts. And the ones that you can think of and care for your children, you're going to get your child anything. Whatever they might, they're wrapped around your finger. You're going to provide for them. The same way a parent cares for their child is how God cares for you. God is a giver of good gifts. And the gift that he most wants to give you is the Holy Spirit. The person who is with you 100% of the time that's walking with you through the day. 
God of the universe wants to be in relationship with you to the extent that you and he are inseparable and he dwells inside of here. Prayer is the space where God's provision meets our needs. Your need of an egg, God will provide it. Your need of some bread, God's gonna provide it in a literal and a spiritual way. There is a gracious God who desires relationship. In that relationship, we are free to ask, knowing God will not give good gifts to harm, but good gifts to bless. Philip Yancey puts it this way in his book on prayer. I pray in astonished belief that God desires an ongoing relationship. I pray and trust that the act of prayer is God's designated way of closing the vast gulf between infinity and me. I pray in order to put myself in the stream of God's healing work on earth. I pray as I breathe because I can't help it. There's a story that dates back to how the Hebrew language came about to call upon the name of Yahweh. And true or not, it makes an interesting point. You ever said the word Yahweh before? Say Yahweh. Now take a big, big breath in. Now take a big breath out. Yahweh. Every breath you breathe is declaring the name of God. That's what prayer is. Every breath you breathe is a cry to the God of the universe. It's the kind of relationship he wants to have with you. Like I mentioned at the beginning, there's something inside of us that keeps us coming back to our knees or at least thinking that we should get on our knees. In joy and in pain, we respond by calling on someone beyond us. And much of our call expresses the desire that heaven would touch earth. That heaven and earth would be one, that as the will of God is done in heaven, it would be done here on this earth and in my heart and in yours. That we and our circumstances would be moved in ways we could not do ourselves. And so we pray, as it is in heaven, Lord, the kingdom and the will of God, would it be done here on earth? Now I recognize we live in the real world that you face circumstances and trials on a daily basis. And I've painted, a, hopefully, a beautiful picture of prayer and what it means to commune with God. But there's something inside of you that's like, I've tried that. I've read that book. I stare at the, the pages blankly. I don't even know. I was talking to someone at the, the, the end of first service that was saying, I sometimes don't even know what to say. You ask me to pray and my mind goes completely blank. That might be you this morning. And if that is, I want to conclude by way of a story. We're going to be journeying over the next few months. And here's how I'll illustrate it. This past summer in August, I know I've told you stories before about going to Glacier National Park and what heaven, you talk about heaven touching earth, Glacier National Park, northwestern Montana, get there, please enjoy the beautiful nature that God has for you. We're there with a couple friend of ours, uh, they've got two kids, uh, uh, and my, my friend is a super avid birder. Any birders in the house? Any of you like to bird? Yeah, a few of you, yeah, yeah, loud and proud, right? Uh, you might be a little bit outnumbered this morning, but that's okay. Uh, and he, he loves to go birding. So he contacted a local guide and he says, I really, really, really want to find a white-tailed ptarmigan. Now, when I heard that the first time, I looked about as much as you do, that is very meaningless for a lot of us, right? Okay, I can guess that it has a white tail, but what's a ptarmigan, right? And it's a particular type of bird that likes winter climates and it likes to live above the tree line. So the guide says, okay, if you want to go see a white-tailed ptarmigan, I need you to meet me at the park entrance at 5.30 in the morning. We're going to drive to the trailhead, and right as the sun is coming up, we need to be on the trail to get where we need to go so we can find this bird. So, okay, get up at like 3.30, in the, because we have to drive about an hour to get to, to, to the park entrance. We get up about 3.30 in the morning, making our lunches in anxious anticipation. We meet up with our guide, and the three of us set out on the trail. And our guide is, uh, was telling us about how he's setting up a nonprofit to raise awareness about birding and to uh, teach birding to young people so that it will help them in the crises in life and uh, kind of, it's cheesy, but off the streets and into birding type of thing. 
Uh, it was really cool what he was talking about and the activism and the awareness that he was bringing to birding. And we shared with him that we were pastors, my friend and I were pastors, and we're just kind of traveling along and the, the sun is now raised up a little bit more and we get up above the tree line and there's this kind of scree slope that we have to make our way across and our guide points and he says, if we're gonna see white-tailed ptarmigans today, they're gonna be over there. And I'll put a picture up on the screen for you. This is to where he pointed. Kind of this rocky outcropping on the side of a mountain up above the tree line. And he says, we need to get over there and then we're gonna spend the rest of our time of our hike. And this was probably about an eight hour hike, five hours up, three hours back. We had about a half an hour that we could spend in this space to see a white tailed ptarmigan. Now he described a white tailed ptarmigan for us. And basically what he was describing was a rock, but just with legs. So You can imagine looking for a rock with legs on a rock slope, right? Like how hard could that be? So I want to put the first picture of the white-tailed ptarmigan up. Did you see it? Or do you see it? Yeah, uh, but you can get what what I'm getting at, right? This bird is almost impossible to see. Some of you are like, I have no idea. I'm going to go back in the live stream. Your neighbor's like, no, it's right there. There is a bird there. Trust me. It just looks like a rock with legs. And we get up to this slope and leave this picture up for now. Don't, don't change it to the next one. We get up on this slope and within about five minutes, we spot the first white-tailed ptarmigan. And our birder is very quick to be like, that's the white-tailed ptarmigan, we get it. But my friend and I, we've got to take some time to learn what a rock with legs looks like and where a rock with legs would like to hang out. But before long, As we recognize one, we begin to recognize another. We begin to recognize another. We begin to recognize her. And all told, I think we saw about 10 or 12 white-tailed ptarmigans. And no, we weren't counting the same one multiple times, okay? Here's another picture of a white-tailed ptarmigan. Absolutely beautiful bird. You can see it a little bit better in this picture. Uh, By the way, this is the old trick with like the binoculars and the cell phone of like trying to see. This is how hard these birds are to see. Now, I... I want to use this story as an illustration of the journey that we're going to be going on. That oftentimes in our lives, we think about prayer as I've just got to say the prayer and, and the answer's going to come. And if my friend and I had expected to see a white-tailed ptarmigan on the trailhead, we would have been waiting for till Jesus comes. We had to get into the habitat of where the white-tailed ptarmigan was. And then not only get into its habitat, but spend time there. Looking for the clues of a bird that is basically a rock with legs. But once we got there, and once we spent the time looking around and understood what a white-tailed ptarmigan looks like, We began to recognize white-tailed ptarmigan after white-tailed ptarmigan after white-tailed ptarmigan. And I will tell you today that prayer is the exact same way. That God is already working in your life. You just might not be in the habitat where he is. God is already working in your life, but you haven't spent the time with him for him to take you to the top of the mountain and say, look, I'm working here and I'm working here and I'm working there. That's what prayer is. Where heaven touches earth, it's getting into communion with God, that our will and his will align. And all of a sudden we realize that the white-tailed ptarmigans were there all along. And the answer to our prayer was there just the same. We're going on a journey over the next three months and I'm excited about what it's gonna do for my life, for your life individually and collectively. And today, we're at the trailhead. We've got a ways to go The promise of white-tailed ptarmigans and prayer is is up on top of the mountain. But today, we're at the trailhead, only beginning the journey towards a better understanding of prayer. And God walks with us the entire way. Prayer is the path to becoming aware of the kingdom and will of God being done as it is in heaven on earth. That is what prayer is all about. I'm excited about this journey. I'll see you on the trail. Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. 
Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church. Thank you.